week we had, uh, was it daylight savings or we leaped forward into the spring. So uh, my body's kind of adjusted back to it. I hope y'all are uh, the same, not as tired this morning. But we're here to begin our new week um, here uh, singing songs and reading scripture and uh, looking forward to Christ. But uh, first, I just wanted to welcome y'all uh, this morning. We're glad y'all are here. If you're a regular that's here every every uh, Sunday, Wednesday, we're glad y'all are here and glad y'all are here to continue uh, the uh, Pursuing the gospel together. I forgot what I was going to say. But if you're a, a new time guest, we are, are glad y'all are here. We don't think you're here just by happenstance. Um, don't think it was just a coincidence that you're here. We think you're here because you're supposed to be here. We're here to hear the gospel and hear how God is working in our lives as, as well as your life. And we're here to share that. And that's one thing at Harvestville we, we really uh, harp on ourselves is that we're a very personable tool church. We want to be part of your community, part of your lifestyle, and that's where we have home groups. And if you don't know what home groups is, John Gillen is over our home groups. And home groups is a group of people that each week, maybe even bi-weekly, they meet together, uh, they push each, push each other to be, you know, more found in Christ and the foundation, and they share their life with them as well. So we encourage you, if you aren't in a home group, to, to get in a home group. Um, I'm in one with Luke and CJ, and, you know, we, we may have a busy life, and we may not meet all the time, but when we do, it's, it's those sound conversations that we have, and we're able to hold each other accountable each week, uh, whether it's just a phone call or a text to check on how somebody's doing. So we encourage you to get in a relationship like that um, here at Harvestville. Um, if you're curious of ways to connect with Harvestville, there is a connection card that you can pick up in the back as well as uh, QR codes behind or in front of you. Uh, you can see the scan with your phone as well as a QR code up here that can get you to our website and see what events we have coming up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on some of those events in, in just a little bit. We have some really cool stuff coming up. But it will also take you how to give online. We've, we've kind of gone from the traditional uh, passing the plate. Now we just give online. So we encourage you all to continue to follow in faith in your giving uh, this year of 2024. I know we have some big goals here at Harvestfield out um, in the blend. You can see some of those and read some of those uh, poster boards. But... Coming up, Easter's a little early this year. Um, Easter is on the 31st, I think that's right. Um, so we're going to have a first Friday, or yeah, a good Friday service the 29th at 6 o'clock. So if y'all could plan ahead, I know Friday nights we're, we're winding up our week, we're ready to kind of chill out, be done with work, but plan to be here on the Friday night. Um, to worship with us. It's always a good time to prepare our hearts for uh, coming on Sunday. So if y'all would, uh, mark that on your calendars, get ready. But we're going to worship this morning. So if y'all would, stand with us and uh, let's sing the gospel together.
I just remarked to Matthew right before that that my, ever since I broke this finger last fall, I have a tough time keeping my pick going the same way. I don't know if y'all saw me chasing my pick there to build that song. It's fun. I just told him that, didn't I? And it happened. <laughs> I appreciate you guys just continuing to go on even though I was over here doing nothing. <laughs>
uh, that the presence of Christ be realized in our midst through the teaching of sound doctrine, the pursuit of sound doctrine. Uh, your greatest need today, you know, I can't meet your needs that you, you think you want or you perceive that you need. Uh, this church can't meet your needs. We can't be everything for you that you think you need. But what we can give you is the greatest gift that we possibly can is Jesus and, and realizing Him and His Word in our lives and laying our lives before Him. Uh, so today's a great, awesome opportunity to see Jesus again and to stir one another into the power of Jesus' ongoing ministry. So uh, welcome to our guest. You're part of our congregation. I'm going to preach to you as you are assembled here in this congregation that, that for such a time, such a place, such as for you, we may uh, be entreated by the Lord together. So in your outline, you're going to see a little bit of a direction of where we're going in this text. We're in a long series since Christmas, taking us from the birth of Christ and ultimately, as Matthew referred to in the greeting or the welcome, Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Christ traditionally, but we preach Christ crucified every Sunday. Uh, we preach Christ risen every Sunday. So uh, this is part of our philosophy of preaching that the resurrection of Christ means everything to us. Uh, it encompasses the totality of what Jesus has done for us in the gospel. So today, again, I'm going to preach about the resurrection of Christ as the text leads us. So be prepared to have your Bible open. You'll see the text and the context text of where we've been, where we're going, and I hope that, I, again, my mission today is to lead you into the text, and may God give you ears to hear the voice of Jesus, not my voice, not this building, not a, not a performance of any kind, but that we would hear and be entreated by Jesus is our goal. Can I get an amen today? So let me tell you, you will hear from Jesus today. It's a 100% guarantee. You will hear Jesus speaking to you. Now, you may hear Him only in your ears. But again, we pray for something supernatural to happen in your heart, in this room today, that Christ be realized, honored, and obeyed. Um, before we get into it, you may notice I'm a little gimpy. Uh, there's this thing at 56 years old called hamstrings. You don't have to worry about hamstrings until you turn 56. I didn't realize they would betray you so bad, but if you stay bent over for a prolonged period of time working down low, and then when you stand up, I mean, I thought I was better until I started walking up those steps and then the gimps got me. So I learned to turn the gimp into to try to make it cool. Instead of limping. I don't know if I'm pulling it off or not, you know, but anyway, we'll see. I couldn't get the salon patch to stay on the back of my leg last night. I uh, taped it on there with painter's tape, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> What's the matter with that dude? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, getting older is great. Uh, you're full of wisdom. You know a lot of things that younger people don't know. We know more than y'all do. And we don't mean to be condescending, but God tempers our, our, our wisdom and, and keeps us from pride by afflicting our bodies with natural decay. So here we go. Uh, today I want to be humble and vulnerable as I limp through the scriptures with you. Before we get real super serious, and again, my goal is not to entertain you today. My goal is not to make you a better leader as, as if that that were our goal. You may, uh, that may happen if the text leads you into, the, into that. Uh, my goal, I don't mind being entertaining from time to time. I don't mind being engaging. I don't, let, I don't mind being very vulnerable with you. And you know that. That's a strength and a weakness sometimes. But uh, I want to share my life with you from time to time. Friday night, Angie and I had an opportunity to go with some friends down to Anniston or Oxford, the, the Oxford, the bougie side of Anniston, uh, to the Performance Arts Center where they have concerts. I did not even know there was such a venue around here. There's nothing like it in Gaston. And it, was, it reminded me of the Alabama Theater. It's the remodeled old courthouse there in Oxford. And had the big chandelier and the box sitting. And it was all fancy schmancy. It was nice. I was underdressed. Or you could dress however you wanted to. We went in and they, they bring in these groups and a lot of them are, are music driven in the sense of uh, uh, a rock band tribute group or a country music group or they may have Travis Tritt or the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And personally, I like both kinds of music, country and western, you've heard me say that. <laughs> I like rock music and especially when the, it's so loud you can't understand the words so you're not convicted by the vulgarisms. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Hear me now and listen later. Uh, so this was an ELO tribute band. ELO, 1970 British rock band. Huh? And so if you don't know who they are, that means good, you're young. All right? So there's about a thousand people in this auditorium and this band was uh, doing the hits of ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra. You know the songs, you can name them. Ellie, you can name five electric ELO songs, couldn't you? Oh yeah. You'd have to look it up in Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> If you don't know what Encyclopedia Britannicas are, it's great. You're good. That means you're not old. I was a world book man, but some of you were Britannica uh, people. So here's about a thousand people, and I guess the age, and this is not, this is just reality. It's uh, The average age is probably 67 years old, because ELO came out in 1970. So I was like the freshman in the, in the group. You know, I wasn't the youngest there, but I wasn't the oldest. Maybe a sophomore. And then I was like, what are all these old people doing around here? And then I realized, oh, I'm one of them. And as the rockers get older, Hunter, we sit down a lot. You know, like in the day at a concert, you're up on your feet, but you can rock and roll seated as you get older. <laughs> Don't eat the popcorn. Don't eat the popcorn. <laughs> all the things that old people do. And so I was just really intrigued and impressed, and, and I'm going to go back, and, and the only thing I'll say, it was the Evil Woman Tour. I don't know if Christians should go to a concert with the Evil Woman, but maybe it was, uh, now I know, but I saw her there. I've known her since the sixth grade. Not that particular woman, but that woman that dances. The, well, I'm going to get myself in trouble. If you want to know, I'll tell you later. But it's that same dance. You see these people. It doesn't matter what the song is. Anyway, right. I did not dance. I did not chew. And I did not dance with the girls that do. Okay, so here we go. All that is to say, check your Facebook page for the Oxford Performing Arts. And maybe, maybe you'll see something you like. And it'll keep you young. Uh, Easter's coming up, as Matthew mentioned. Who are you inviting? You got somebody in mind? You're going to bring them. Perfect opportunity. It's a cultural tradition. Easter's Easter's. We preach Christ crucified every week. Resurrection every week. It'd be a great opportunity for you to forcibly bring somebody. Intentionally, passionately. If you thought you knew their greatest need, the answer to their greatest need, if you really thought that Jesus, even the, the bumbling, stumbling preaching of His Word, if you really thought that Christ resides in His Word so that every time we open the book, every time I read the text, every time we swim around in the text, there's something supernaturally happening that the most lost person, if there were grades of lostness, but the person you're afraid of the most, of inviting, it's not beyond the healing and redemptive power of Jesus in His Word. Jesus is on His throne in heaven right now, but the Holy Spirit is resident among us. Not only in our hearts, but He's among us. And He is the one that leads us into the conviction of sin, into the hearing of Jesus' words in the text. And so in the preaching of sound doctrine, invite your friends to Jesus. Not to me, not to the... the like I said, we cannot meet their needs. But we can preach Jesus to them and we can share our lives with them. So have somebody that you're praying and watching and then doing about inviting. And that leads us into the text today. Today we are looking at the ministry of Jesus in the region of Galilee. His healing, His teaching, these miracles, His fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises made to Israel are now being embodied and, and symbolized and fulfilled in, in actuality in Jesus Christ. And so even from last week, how Jesus can rule over and have authority over the fish of the sea and even the destinies of men. He captures men. He catches them alive and constrains their lives to be lived out in a calling for the purposes of the kingdom of God. Regular fishermen like you and I, regular people, captured by the presence of Jesus, the command of Jesus, and the call of Jesus. And so we're going on into the text that Luke is writing to his recipient, Theophilus, if you remember from chapter 1, an orderly account of the ministry of Jesus 
And so today we're led into this increasing realization of opposition against the ministry of Christ. We saw it in the desert with the devil or the wilderness with Satan's temptations. We saw it with the demons trying to resist Jesus. We see it with disease and infirmities trying to, to test the authority of Jesus, if you will, circumstantially. And Jesus prevails, he prevails, he prevails. And then today we're seeing another layer of opposition materialize, and that's opposition from the Jewish leaders, from the very institution, the very people, the very nation of Israel, in which received the seedbed of faith, if you will, through the Old Testament, now when they receive the fulfillment, the, the fruit of that seed in the person of Jesus Christ. So the establishment, if you want to say it like that, you're going to see in the text today, was resistant and would be all the way to the cross. So this increasing opposition gives us the backdrop. In this instance, does Christ have the authority on earth to forgive sin? We know that he has authority to command devils. We know he has the authority that Satan cannot rival him. He cannot, he cannot prevail against Jesus. We see that sickness and disease have to give in to the healing power of Jesus Christ. What about the forgiveness of sin? So a marvelous story today. A little bit of your background before I get into the text and get into the preaching. Background of Luke 5 and 6, you can see it there. He is, he is affecting and proclaiming salvation. Jesus is your salvation. Jesus is God's salvation. Listen to him. Do what he tells you to do. If you need wants you to do and you're worried about other things the things of this world get in between you and Jesus the things of decision makings and circumstances and, and right and, and, and true true perceptions but the greater perception is what does Jesus want you to do what is he beckoning you to do what is his voice and his teachings instructing you how, how do, are you to respond in your outline, I try to give you a little synopsis of what the text means, and that's in Luke 5, 17 through 26. Look in your outline. The healing of a paralyzed man, and you're going to see that today, proves Christ's authority on earth to forgive sins. So he gave evidence of an internal abstraction. The external evidence that Jesus had forgiven the man's sins, and that's internal, was that the, the forgiven man rose up and walked out glorifying God. That was the external evidence. And then here's the hard question for your discipleship. What is your evidence of the fact that you have been forgiven? And most of you would say you're Christians and I believe you. I've seen your lives. We walk out this, this glorious struggle of becoming like Christ. More and more we walk that out together. But theologically, if I was to ask you the proof, how do you know you've been forgiven of your sin? And you're going to have a better answer at the end if, you're, if your mind's uh, struggling for an answer. Because you can't say, no, I just believe. Well, I understand that. But what is the evidence of your belief? What's the substance? What is the command of Jesus' pronouncement of forgiven over your life? How do you see it working? And so you're going to see the premise of the theological truth there in the text today. And we're going to do our best. I'm going to befriend you and try to walk you through that in a real uh, understandable way, if I can, uh, to see this evidence of a forgiven life. So today, bringing the text forward. I am preaching the text to you, and here's what I would like for you to understand, Harvest Phil. We must believe that man's greatest need is the forgiveness of sin through the authority of Christ. Let me slow down. So we look at how do you build a great church? How would you fill every seat? How would you do all these things in the eyes of the world? Success. And I think I'm smart enough to know that in the world's view of things. But then what does the text of scriptures constrain us for your friends that need to be invited to Christ? What are you worried about? Are you worried about when they get here if they'll like the music or if they'll like the preaching or if Eric says something strange or weird or if they're not? You know, we worry about these tangible things. 
But what is man's greatest need? We're going to see that brought to the forefront of our thinking again in the text today. Jesus is the one who raises us up by his own word. That's why we are not at a deficit since Christ is on the throne in heaven. He is presiding, but we're not at a deficit. We're not, we're not without recourse because it is in the word of Christ that his power calls men, calls women, calls young people to follow him and creates an effect in their hearts and in their lives. So y'all are this audience today. You are hearing Christ by faith today as we preach the words of Jesus. So what a, what a proposition. We must do everything we can do to bring people into the presence of Christ's teachings. Can you squeeze out an amen if you understand that? Now, it's, it's, a, it's a different philosophy of preaching than the world holds on to. It's a different philosophy than, than maybe people prefer. But as we preach the Word, as we are drawn into the truth of Jesus, we, we believe that we can invite people to this endeavor. Um, and not be so afraid, is it good or is it bad? Is it entertaining? Is it challenging? Is it beneficial? To know that the greatest need of your friends and of yourself, everyone in the room, is to receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ. So in the text today, we're going to look at this rising Jewish controversy. Uh, the Jews that observed this miracle were asking to themselves, and I kind of paraphrase it in the text, who does this man think he is? The Jews would accept Jesus as a miracle worker, as a, some kind of prophet. I was in the gym the other night talking to, I've got strange relationships with outsiders at the gym. They're, they're guys uh, that aren't necessarily insiders of religious people or in the church. We're going to talk about insiders and outsiders. And I love talking to outsiders and their perspective about the church, about theology, about Jesus, about the gospel, about Islam, about Mormons, about uh, Jewish people, and all kinds of different cross sections that I get to talk to. And I was explaining to one fellow the other night, he says, well, we all worship the same God. I said, no, we don't. He says, yeah, the Muslims, they worship, they worship the same God we do. The Mormons, they worship the same God we do. The Jews, they worship the same God we do. And I understand how people want to say that simply because some things overlap with uh, Old Testament views of, of God from the beginning. But when you get to Jesus... He is the one who shows us who God is. And if you don't believe in Jesus, if the Muslim doesn't convert to Christ, if the Jew doesn't convert to Christ, if the Mormon doesn't convert to Christ, they will remain lost and without hope. It's a different God if it's not the face of Jesus Christ on the cross, risen on the third day. Christ is our Redeemer. We have compassion for people um, who think differently. We evangelize people who think differently. And my advice to that young man who had a Muslim friend and he was trying to evangelize and the Muslim was trying to evangelize him. I said, keep quoting scriptures. Know the Word. Because the power of salvation is in the Word and the person of Jesus Christ. It's something supernatural that takes place when we proclaim Him. Thank you for that amen. That's the echoing across the room. So I was watching Ben Shapiro. He's a good debater. You all know him, Ben Shapiro. He talks real fast. He's kind of like real nerdy and he's really smart. He debates all people. He's kind of funny. He's Jewish. And somebody asked him what he, who, what he believed about Jesus. He said he was just another failed, zealous rebel. Not the same God. So here the Jewish opposition not to, you know, hate on the Jews, but the reality of their being the people of God in the Old Testament, rejecting God in the New Testament. Some were saved. Some came to follow Christ. There's always a remnant. Hallelujah. But by and large, the, the, the opposition that led Jesus to the cross, certainly it was the devil, certainly it was different aspects of the tension of the kingdom of God, but mainly it was the unbelief of the Jews that God used to deliver His Son to the cross for your sins and mine. 
So today in the text, we're going to look at the placement of this story, and you can see it in the text. We're going to look at the pronouncement of forgiveness that just caused everybody to lose their mind, some good, some bad, the protest of the church leaders, and then number four on the outline, we're going to look at the proof of Christ's authority. Now, here's the most important part. We're going to read the text out loud. I'm going to read Jesus to you. You're going to hear him speak. You're going to see him work. You're going to see the results of Jesus' salvation. You ready? It's a big deal. It's better than ELO. Electric Light Orchestra of 1970. Don't, <laughs> don't keep me down, groups. Don't keep me down. Bruce. It's Bruce. He just made up a word, but people think it's Bruce. Don't keep me down. Do, do, do. The text, okay, here we go. I don't know Taylor Swift. I don't know any of her songs, couldn't name one. I'll just stick with ELO. <laughs> Jesus has been healing, teaching, throughout Galilee, declaring salvation, and, and the term I used earlier was he also affects salvation. He brings salvation. So not only does Jesus teach salvation, He brings salvation. Here's another occasion, maybe a little different in chronology from the other Gospels. Luke puts it in here. You can find it parallel in Matthew, Mark, and John. It's a fantastic story. Listen. On one of those days as He was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and... From Jerusalem, 60 miles away. And the power of the Lord was with him, Jesus, to heal. We know that. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. And let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. I'll take just a breath here. In the other Gospels, we have some more details. This is possibly Peter's house again at Capernaum. Uh, meeting in his house. All these sick people were coming to Christ. And the multitudes were, were restricting access. And then uh, we're also told maybe four friends in the other Gospels. So some friends saw a paralytic's need. Now what did they see his greatest need was? Let me just say right here in the middle of our text. What would those friends think that man's greatest need is? Physical healing. Physical healing. That's normal, right? And that's like you looking at yourself and your neighbors. What? Oh, Eric needs this or Luke needs that or, or Rodney needs this. And, but then it's really Jesus and His authority who assesses your needs and my needs and, and offers us the greater resolution. But finding no way to bring him in because the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. Verse 20, and when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 21, look at the reaction. And the scribes, Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, as I read the scripture there, could you just have kind of go, Oh, yeah. They're asking the right question. Even in their unbelief, who can forgive sins but God alone? Verse 22, When Jesus perceived their thoughts, He answered them, Why do you question in your hearts. He gives them a proposition. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? Verse 24 is the key to interpretate, interpreting this text. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go Close the quote. See right there? And go home. And, and here's my word. 
in the Gospel of Luke. What is it? And immediately, immediately, he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home and look at the goal of this salvation event, glorifying God. Man's paralyzed. We thought his greatest need was healing. Christ forgave his sins because of faith was there. We're going to see that in just a minute. Rise and walk. Be raised. Be raised and walk and glorify God. Amazing presentation of the gospel. I say amazing. Verse 26. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. And amazement seized them all. Sorry about that. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe or phobos, fear of God, the awe of God, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Now, when we come to the end of that text, I don't want you to think that's just a bedtime story. I don't want you to think it's just another Bible story for your consideration. Certainly, I want you to consider it. But this story, because Jesus is resident in this teaching, is effectual for this congregation. This should have effect on your heart. You should hear questions from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is bringing your life into contact with the Word of God in this very room at this very moment. Now our minds wander, we look at other things, we think about other things, but let's take a few moments, if you will, and look at the outline and see how I've divided it up. Let me encourage you a little bit as we continue to study the text. All right, so... Jewish controversy. What, who does this man think he is? Number one, the placement of the story. So one of these days, as he was going through Galilee, teaching and healing, he was doing that. Pharisees and the representatives of Israel and the keepers of the law, the professionals, came and they were drawn to Jesus as well. Do you remember the ministry of John the Baptist? When he went out into the wilderness, the people of Israel would go out into the wilderness. And so here Jesus was in the obscurity of the Galilean countryside and Israel's elite had come out to hear this man or see the spectacle. We know from stereotypes that crowds expect miracles. Uh, crowds expect some sort of food or some sort of reward or some time type of material actualization, realization. But here Jesus is satisfying in the sense of teaching, but he was also a miracle worker as well. Drawing large crowds, here are the Pharisees, and then here his ability was to heal was inherent as he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that we preached about a couple of weeks ago. Are you still with me in the technical things? Why do we preach in the technical things? Because that's what the text says. What's your greatest need seated here today is to hear Jesus, is to interact with Jesus, is to listen to Jesus and receive what he wants to give you. Our quorum Deo, that means living in, in the presence of God, our life in the presence of God. And this is very easy. This is a very simple sermon today. As we teach the sound doctrine of Jesus, our Savior, according to his scriptures, we can expect that his presence in his word to provoke a response. We can expect it to provoke a response. Um, and then I put insiders and outsiders are listening. So, you know, you got people who were raised in the church and they know the church lingo. They know all four stanzas of the hymns and love lifted me is their favorite song. It's my earliest childhood memory standing up in the front seat of my daddy's 1965 long wheelbase white Chevrolet. Three on the tree, six cylinder. I would broke all the modern child safety laws. My seat belt was my daddy's strong arm. I knew it. I sang it. I grew up in the church. I was an insider, but that didn't mean I was naturally or, or, or saved. I had to come to a personal relationship, a realization of my sin and Christ's sacrifice on the, on the cross. I had to have that internal call in my life of hearing Jesus in the scriptures that I was familiar with. So then we have outsiders, people who don't go to church. They're not concerned. They know a little bit about Jesus. 
They don't know him very well. They certainly haven't surrendered their lives to him. They just added him to their life. They would be the person who thinks, well, we all worship the same God. Can't we all get along? That would be an outsider perspective because nothing of the scriptures has taken real effect over their mindset in their lives. So we had people that were desiring to be healed. We had people, faithful Jews, that were listening to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And then we had the skeptics of the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were putting Jesus on trial. So there was a, a wide audience. And so whenever Jesus speaks, it always elicits a reply. Every Sunday, you go out of here today, and if I've done my work in the text, it may not be good. You may not think it was, that was a good sermon or that was a bad sermon. I got you. All right? But every time we read Jesus, you reply. How I many of you have learned that on texting, no reply is a reply? How I many of you ever sit there and you, the person turns their read receipts off and you're like, or they go off the grid and don't have an iPhone and they get some sort of article phone or something that's always green and you can't tell what they've said. So in this here, this teaching of Jesus and his ministry was causing, drawing a crowd and eliciting a response. So that's the placement of the story. Number two, the controversy that is brewing is the pronouncement of forgiveness. And behold, some men, other gospels say four men, bringing on a bed or a pallet, a man who was paralyzed. We don't know what degree he was paralyzed. Uh, he doesn't say a word in this story, but he goes away glorifying God. So maybe he could speak, but he couldn't walk or he wasn't mobile. But they were seeking to bring him in to this house where Jesus was teaching and healing. But the crowd was an obstacle. The stereotypes was an obstacle. Y'all always, have y'all been in big crowds of people and there may be someone that, that has a physical infirmity. And they're always struggling to make their way through crowds. So they devised a plan in Palestine, you know, a lot of the architecture of the day, there was a two-story dwelling and there were stairs up the outside and in the cool of the day or in the heat of the day or in the evening of the day, whenever it was, they could go on the roof and cook and the kitchen uh, was oftentimes set up there with either a thatched hood or a uh, roof or a, a clay tile ceiling, whichever one, you can do your architectural archaeology. But they devised a plan that they would open up the roof and lower the man. It says ropes in the other Gospels. He lowered him down such an intrusion into the ministry of Jesus. The breaking of protocol that our roof... Oh, we planned that. I don't know what that... I think that was my, my hamstring. <laughs> I heard it. Now I've got adrenaline right now. I get the best adrenaline rush preaching. Yeah, I don't know if y'all think about that. That's why after I preach, I look so sad. The roof began to part and dust fall down and the sunlight breaking in and here comes a man being lowered down. They went to extreme inconvenience, extreme concern that the best thing this man needed was to get in front of Jesus. No matter what others thought, no matter what society thought, no matter what it cost them, they had to fix the roof. Like I said, I've often preached this was Peter's house. Can you imagine him? Oh, praise God. I've got to fix the roof. Everybody's glorifying God. He's going, oh, who's going to help me fix the roof, Jesus? Sorry. Insurance, insurance. My deductible's $1,000. So here the need, look back in the text. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and let him down with his bed through, through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. What a strange surprise. Healing was in view. Don't you think the friends thought, man, with this, this man, we don't know why he was paralyzed. We don't know if there was something he was doing sinful that caused this paralysis. And we've talked about that. You know, you can't always equate prosperity and, and suffering or, or this. A doesn't always equal B in the economy of the human life. Okay, so this man was paralyzed. And no matter how he was paralyzed, his friends thought he needed the healing touch of Jesus. And Jesus purposefully, he saw their faith and he says, your sins are forgiven. They went, what? 
What do you think the initial heart reaction was of the friends? They went, oh no. Dude, now we're going to have to carry him back out. We wanted him healed, Jesus. It's all that, that internal abstract stuff. We're glad that his sins are forgiven. I didn't, we didn't know that was in the scope of your ministry. But don't you know they were a little disappointed, just like you are, when God gives you the best things, but you wanted other things. When Matthew and Mason were little and Christmas time was always so fun, I told Luke this story before Christmas, you know, your kids will come up with all kinds of crazy things they want for Christmas. And for you who are parents of young kids, your list is getting longer. Back in the day, it was like 10 things. I've stood in those lines. Angie stood in those lines. Back when we had this thing, there was this thing called the Gaston Mall back in the day. It had all these stores in it. They were like toy stores. And you'd go down there and it's like KB Toys. And you'd line up because you got these things in the mail. It was like where people brought stuff to your house on paper. And they'd bring these sale. It was like paper with pictures of toys on it. And you'd look at them and it would tell you when to be there. At 4 a.m. standing in line at KB Toy for some electronic toy that I think was possessed because even when we took the batteries out of it, it still said during the night, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> Didn't it, Angie? Well, look, take them batteries out. <laughs> Angie, take those batteries out. I did! I did! Ah! <laughs> what? Oh, Hopper, the grasshopper. Uh, Bugs Life is dating our kids. I know, but there was this movie called Bugs Life. It was from Pixar. It was really, there was this thing called Hopper. And it was this animated robot thing. And it's in Mason's room. We took the batteries out. He'd steal them. <laughs> but we finally learned as a parent to convince your child what they wanted. I'd take them shopping. I said, wouldn't you like to have that? No, I'd like to have that. Wouldn't you really like to have that? No, I'd like to have that. Wouldn't you really like Boy, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I think I want that. So on Christmas, our children got what they thought they wanted. In a bridge a little bit, Jesus calls out to you to give you what you need. What your greatest need is begins with the forgiveness of sin. The restoration of your wayward soul your lost soul, to be brought back to God through the work and faith of Jesus Christ. Um, in your outline there in the Quorum Deo after this section, it still amazes me that uh, the theological point, how did Jesus know that this was faith? Because Jesus is God. Not only did He know these men and this paralyzed man were coming to Him in faith, God, whatever You want to give. God, we would love to be healed, but I just need to be laid bare at your feet, oh God. And, and Jesus, being God, He perceived the hearts of men. He knows your heart. Just like He would perceive the hearts of the Pharisees in the next verses. Just as the thief on the cross, He, he didn't get baptized. He didn't get a perfect attendance pen at, at, at church. He couldn't go through the explanations of the theology of justification and sanctification and glorification. All He knew that He was in great need. And he didn't cry out, save me from this death. He says, remember me when you come into my, your kingdom. And Jesus saw faith. That's what Jesus does as God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 tells us that faith is a gift from God. Faith only comes from God. And Jesus knows how to recognize what is from God. How did he know these people? Did they earn salvation? No. They were putting salvation on display. Something supernatural of the kingdom was happening. And for such a time as this, or such a time as that, Jesus displayed forgiveness in response to God-given faith. So He looked beyond the external need and He gave Him the greatest thing. Look at this Coram Deo. This is you. This is everyone in the room. Bear with me. We think we know what our greatest needs are, but often we are only focusing on our circumstances. Would you say that was true? Can you give me an amen, friendly amen? That's me. Oh God, if my hamstring was just better, I would praise you. No, you wouldn't. How do you know? Because you just heard it. The problems you are facing today is not 
your spouse, your children or your parents, it's not your job, your boss, your co-workers, it's not your lack of resources, shortage of time, or insufficient income. All those, those things kind of preoccupy our time, don't they? Your greatest need is to be laid helpless at the feet of Jesus by faith. And then let's just imagine you were lowered down in front of Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. All authority is in his hands. He heals, he creates, he sustains. He is superior and above all things. He is God with us. And you were laid bare and you finally said, I'm sorry, Jesus, I'll quit asking. I'll quit telling you what I think I need. Oh, Lord, what do I need? Would you do that? Can you do that? Could you do that in that moment right there? Could you finally just stop worrying about everything you can't control, everything around you that you think is wrong with you? I don't care how serious your physical need is and how preoccupied. Could you stop by faith and say, Jesus, you tell me what do I need? For some of you, it is the forgiveness of sins unto salvation. For some of you, it is the forgiveness of sins to restoration. But you're so preoccupied thinking these other things are your problem. But your biggest problem is you. In the sense where we lose sight of the ministry of Christ, even in the preaching. Even I know I preach a long time. I know, I know we, we go over the text over and over and over and again. I think it's the greatest need we have. And I'm preaching this by faith. Number three. The controversy, there's this protest. Who is this man? They were accusing him of blasphemy. Who can forgive sins? But God, the unbelief of the Pharisees was obvious here. And then Jesus posed a question. Well, which one is easier then? To say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? And obviously, what's the answer to Jesus' rhetorical question? The obvious answer is easier to say your sins are forgiven because it requires no proof. It's an internal subjectivity. It's, it would be someone that is trying to uh, deceive somebody. Well, yeah, that happened. Well, how do we know? Well, it's internal. Who can judge? Well, here Jesus gave evidence that he has authority on earth to forgive sin. He told the man to rise up and walk. He told the man to respond to the forgiveness that Jesus had given him. Uh, how do you know Jesus has forgiven you? I'm going I'm to tip your thinking to the end of the sermon. How do you know you have been forgiven? Because the command of salvation is to repent, turn to Christ, and follow, and walk. Be raised out of your sin. Be raised out of your grave. Have the new life of Christ applied to your life. And then the evidence of that is to walk. To walk. And glorify God in the newness of life. The Coram Deo for number three. Is that the tangible evidence for our forgiveness is the resurrection of Christ. Now that's the, the ultimate theological explanation. Christ has been raised. So then by faith, Christ's resurrection is our being raised to a new life as well. By faith, we participate in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Uh, if, if you have been buried with Christ in His death, you've also been raised with Christ in the glory of His resurrection. It's not only made evident in this story, but you think about the story in the Gospel of John of Lazarus. Dead in the grave. Dead three days. Jesus called Him. Lazarus rose from the dead. Took off the grave clothes and lived a life in the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. So look at this. This is your story. Have you been raised? And if you have, you walk in it, seeking Christ's kingdom. Uh, the grace of God, through the faith of God that He gives, is effectual. It changes people. So how about you? Are you spending your life chasing circumstances? Worried about everything you can't control? The let go of the illusion that you control anything. Sometimes one of the greatest deceptions that I got it like I like it. And God reminds us with various crises and their human frailty that He's the one that's in control. Well, why not submit to Him and receive from Him, like this man, the forgiveness of sin, but also, number four, in this controversy, the proof of Christ's authority. I love it. I love it. 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? And to prove, Jesus said in verse 24, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, rise, take up your mat, walk, and He did. Every person that hears the call of Christ and the command of the authority of Christ obeys Him. So who doesn't obey? The people that don't hear. They don't understand. They're caught up. They're, they're distracted. They're, they're lost. So what do we do? We compel them. We present and engage them with Christ over. I preach the gospel over and over the same message every Sunday, wherever the text takes us. Humble yourself. Hear Christ's call. Repent, believe, and follow. Would you do that today again and again? Are you hearing Christ in the text today? I love it because let me just spend some time. Let me glance at the clock. And oh, it's always 1136. I can tell. Um, the Son of Man is a Messianic title out of Daniel 713. And if you read Daniel 7, it's the picture of the ascension of Christ. His dominion, His authority, not only as God, but also as a representation of the saints. It's a messianic title that the Jews should have understood. Every, every time Jesus used a reference for Himself, His most popular reference was Son of Man. And that's an allusion to Daniel. His authority is God on earth to direct the affairs of God's people. To call them into a future reality that is even tasted of in the here and now. The kingdom of God in the here and now. He told the man to rise like Lazarus. He told the man to rise like Jesus would rise on the third day. He told the man to rise and walk in a personal picture of a resurrection. It was a verifiable demonstration of God's power to pardon sin because the man could stand up just as Jesus stood up on the third day. Have you stood up at the call of Christ? Have you been raised out of a grave of, of sin and doubt? Have you been freed from the circumstances that compete for your affection and your devotion? Have you followed Christ? Have you been captured by His salvation? Our Coram Deo, the last one, is when our sins are forgiven, we, walk, we rise and walk. Has your life been laid bare at the feet of Jesus by faith? Have you heard His commands? Have you been raised up to walk in His forgiveness? And glorify God. Is your life glorifying God? Is your purposes, have they been redirected toward God? Has your greatest need been to be with Christ been redirected? There's several things to think of. And I want our prayer partners to be ready. Have your needs. You can even be coming to the front. Because we want to pray with these people. Because God is affecting their hearts. So if you're a prayer partner, as I'm reading these things, would you come and stand at the front? These can be for your home group or they can be for you right now. Think, what has Jesus taught you in these scriptures today? And then what is your response? These people are here just as friends, confidential to hear if you want to verbalize your response or seek counsel in your response. Christ is calling. How are you responding? Number two, do you have the faith to bring hurting people into the ministry of Christ's resurrection and His teaching. And that would be for the rest of us at Harvest Field. We do a great job of being a friendly church and a greeting church. We need to grow in being an inviting church. There's plenty of room. Um, not because the stage merits people's uh, expectations, but because we have a glorious Savior in which to proclaim supernaturally. Number three, how does a re resurrected life glorify God? What is your salvation story? Why is it so extraordinary um, when compared to the world? Is this man's life, it was extraordinary to see such things. Number four, Harvest Field um, cannot give insiders and outsiders everything they think they need. We just can't do it. We don't have the budget. I don't have the talent. I don't have the entrepreneurial spirit to try to be such a consumer-driven um, ministry, but we have Jesus. All that other stuff will follow along. We have Jesus to preach and proclaim and sing. Um, do you feel that compelling truth in your heart? Number five, who are you bringing to Harvest Field on Easter's? On Easter's, you'll say I put the S, that's the movie reference to Nacho Libre. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm serious. I'd like to ask, who are you bringing and why not? Why, you don't have a neighbor. You don't have a friend. You don't have a voice. You don't have a desire. You don't see anybody in need. Think about it. Pray about it. Move. Rise up and walk about it. Number six. How does this passage of Scripture 
cause you to pray. And it should. You know, if, you, if you're not, you may be distracted, you may be not thinking about it, but whenever we preach Christ, He brings and elicits a response from you. Would you stand? Let me pray. And I want you to look at these four people, and they're your friends, and some others will be here. John's in the back. If you're going out and feel compelled to pray, or I liked last week how you turned to one another and prayed, and that does our heart good. The prayer is basically an accountability of your response. And then a help if you need it. If you're struggling today, if you're confused today, if you need clarity today, we would love to pray for you and counsel with you in these moments. But don't forget your ministry on the way out. Don't forget to pray about who you could invite to Harvest Field on Easter. And I'm not, let me just say, y'all know, I'm not pressing for numbers. We've had 800 before on Easter and it was glorious. If we have 200 on Easter, it'd be glorious if it's, if it's the, your faithfulness and your invitation and your concern. Um, God will afford us His blessings no matter what. But there's no reason. You can invite somebody. Think about these things. Pray about these things. We're here for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the glory of this resurrection. That this paralyzed man demonstrated what the forgiveness of sins does for us. It raises us from death, from paralysis, so that we can walk in the newness of life that Jesus brings. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. He shows us our future. That even though we die, we will live again. Our souls and our bodies will be restored together and we will be with the Lord and be like the Lord. God, I pray for the hurting person today, for the confused person today, for the person who's chasing after the circumstances of their life. They continually bring to you in prayer that they need this, 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 and this. And I would pray, Holy Spirit, that you've convinced one here today that really what they need is to be humble and laid bare at the feet of Jesus and listen to Him to tell us, tell them what they need. Thank you for your generosity, Lord Jesus. It's for your glory I've preached, I've prayed, and I submit it to your people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. God bless you guys very much.